Now we'll start the remainder of chapter three. The title of it will be Simple Linear Regression. A regression equation also can be called a least squares equation or line of best fit involves one independent variable, the predictor, which is X, and one dependent variable, the predicted value, which is Y. Our job is going to be to find the equation of a straight line, but not any line, the line that fits the data the best, that'll go through the middle of the data point. So this equational relationship between X and Y is expressed as Y equals beta sub naught plus beta sub one times X, where beta sub naught is where the data crosses the Y intercept. Beta sub one represents the slope. If we interpret our equation for the slope, it would be as X increases by one unit, y is going to increase if it's positive or decrease if it's negative by the slope amount. We'll only interpret the slope if x is a good predictor of y. So when we actually apply this to problems, we'll always substitute what the y variable's name is, such as sales, and what the x variable's name is, such as advertising. We talked about the correlation coefficient last time. Now we're going to square R and talk about the coefficient of determination. It's the percent of variation in Y that is explained by X. So in other words, if I have R squared of 82% and I'm explaining sales with advertising dollars, then 82% of sales can be explained by the amount spent on advertising. If we take one minus R squared, that leaves us 18%, which is unexplained. We can call the equation a model. We'll be also looking at a value called the root mean square error. Sometimes it's called the standard error of the estimate. The smaller the standard error, the closer the points will be to the regression line, the better the predictive power of that line. We can interpret the standard error by using the empirical rule. We could say approximately 95% of the predicted values will be within plus and minus two times the standard error. It just gives us a, a visual representation of where the data is falling when we use that e e equation to explain the variable. Some warnings about using regression. We never want to use values beyond the range of the given x's to predict y. So if we were going to predict how much dog food to feed a dog based on his weight, we would only want to use values between, say, 4 pounds up to 100 pounds. Otherwise, if we start using great big dogs, it would be extrapolating data, which gives us large errors in prediction. We never want to go beyond three to five time periods if time is our X variable. That's extrapolating too far into the future. And then we never want to say X caused Y unless we've done a controlled experiment. Most business data is observational and not experimental. We'll also get confidence intervals on the slope. So when we work it out, we'll have an interval estimation taking the slope plus and minus two times the standard error of the slope. 
if zero falls in the interval, then that's a possible value for the slope, so x is not a good predictor of y, because no slope means that y is not moving with x. If both values in the interval are either positive or both are negative, the slope is significantly different from zero and x does have some predictive power. We can also perform a hypothesis test on the slope. HO is the null hypothesis. Then we'll use the symbol beta sub 1 for the slope. We'll always put equals in H sub O and we'll set it equal to the value of zero. So H sub O says there is zero slope. The alternative hypothesis, H sub A, says that the slope does not equal zero. Therefore, you would have a good predictor. So now we look at our jump output and we will find that weight is your x variable for the dog and the slope was 0.045. The standard error of the slope was 0.002589 and we get a T ratio of 17.43. That's the test statistic. If T's P value, the probability of T, if that P value is less than the given alpha, say 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, we would say there is slope. So weight is a good predictor of how much food to feed the dogs. Next, we'll do something called residual analysis. A residual is the difference between an observed value of y at a given x and the predicted value of y at that same level of x. This will all make so much more sense when we actually look at an example. The mean of the residuals is always zero. We should not see severe outliers in our data for the final model. The residuals should be normally distributed. Typically, if there are no severe outliers, we can assume it's normal. And the residuals should also plot in a random fashion. So they should look like a shotgun target. In understanding residuals, we'll start with the jump output here. The first column of numbers are simply identifiers for each data point. The weight is your x variable, cups is the y variable, and then you have predicted cups. So the difference there, the original cups were the observed values. The predicted cups occur from putting the 88 pound dog into the equation, and that is our value here of 5.06. Then we have predicted cups two, because in the first run, I discovered a severe outlier. How did I do that? We calculate the residuals. So when we take the observed cups of food, 5.5 for an 88 pound dog, minus the predicted cups of 5.06, we get the residual amount here. Then we put that on a standardized scale called a studentized residual. If a studentized residual has a value that is over the absolute value of three, it is considered a severe outlier. So the only dog in the study that had a studentized residual greater than three was our 24th dog who happened to be a St. Bernard weighing 190 pounds. When I discover that severe outlier, I go into jump and right click on that item number 24 and I ask it to hide and exclude that record. Then I rerun the data and I get the predicted cups too, which 
is going to be a better model with a smaller standard error, therefore better predictions. Here we see the new graph of the residuals predicted by our plotted values. And it is much more normal looking. They're random in nature. And this is what we want to see in our residual output. Also, in the normal graph, all of the points now fall within the two dotted red lines. That means there are no severe outliers. After removing the severe outlier, the resulting model is this. Under linear fit, we find the actual regression equation. CUPS equals 0.73 plus 0.055 times weight. R squared is at the top under summary of fit is 0.982. We multiply that by 100 to get a percentage, and so we would interpret that as 98.2% of the variation in cups of food required is explained by the weight of the dog. So if I take 1 minus 0.982, I get 0.018, or 1.8% of the variation is unexplained. Now, go on down under R squared, and we'll skip R squared adjusted for now. Find root mean squared error. If we interpret that, again, we use the empirical rule, and we would say about 95% of the predicted food required will be within plus and minus two times that standard error of 0.2547. Or this equation will get results that will be within plus and minus 0.51 cups of food. Then our interpretation of the slope. The slope in the equation is the ver value in front of the weight variable. So we're interpreting 0.055. As the weight of the dog increases by one pound, the number of cups of food required increase by 0.055. Now we're going to talk about predicting y values. We're going to use the regression equation, cups equal 0.73379 plus 0.055 times weight. We put that in a weight of a dog into that equation, so a 70 pound dog would need 4.58 cups of food. Then we can also get jump to give us a confidence interval on the mean value of y given x. Again, x would be the 70 pound dog in this case, and we'll look in the jump output for the 95% confidence interval. Next door to that is a prediction interval on an individual value of y. So for just one dog versus an average amount of dogs weighing 70 pounds, we would use the prediction or individual interval. So here are our interpretations. The 95% confidence interval would be interpreted as so. Using 95% confidence, the mean amount of dog food for 70 pound dogs falls between 4.44 and 4.72 cups. The important words there are how confident are we and that the mean amount falls between those two values. In the prediction interval, we say using 95% confidence, if one dog weighs 70 pounds, the amount of food required falls between 4.04 and 5.13 cups. You'll notice that the prediction interval is always wider than the confidence interval.